Good morning. All right, we'll get started if there aren't any questions. Um, Professor, uh, just a heads up, we still can't view the comments on the um, exam. Oh, did you try? I, I opened it up last night. I thought people told me they could see it. Um, oh, I guess. Uh, oh, okay, I see it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> no problem. And then, like I said, those comments uh, may not mean a lot to you, but they'll mean something to me. So let me know if you have any questions. Um, and I'll work on a solution uh, before the end of the week, hopefully. Okay. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any issues. If you want to go over anything, um, uh, you know, specific to your situation, you want to set up an appointment with me, you don't want to do it in a regular office hour, that's fine too. Just let me know. We'll set something up, okay? All right, uh, let's start with this one. So we've got uh, five packages on a conveyor belt. They are moving to the right at a constant speed of two meters per second. And we want to know um, the net force on each package. You're going to rank the net force on each of these packages. Okay, how are we doing on this one? There's no acceleration, right? They're moving at constant velocity. There's no acceleration. So the net force on every one of these boxes has to be zero. That is correct, good. Okay, let's make it a little more interesting. So let's let the acceleration be uh, three meters per second squared to the right. And at this instant, the velocity is also uh, the same as it was in this problem, two meters per second to the right. And don't rank them, find the net force on each block in terms of the mass.
sum of the forces is equal to ma. And the mass of the first block is 2m. The acceleration is 3. So we've got a net force of 6m to the right. And you could just go through and do them all here. F net is, what was the next one? 4m. And then you get uh... good. Yep. Okay, let's try this one. Uh, we've got these water skiers. The rope is pulling them forward and there's some kind of resistive force between their skis and the water pushing back on them. And uh, the resistive force is different for each of these skiers. The, um, and they're moving, uh, where are we here? They're moving at constant speed. The speeds are different, but they're all moving at constant speed. Okay, rank the net force on all of these. Professor? Yeah. Um, if they're all at constant speed, then it really wouldn't matter uh, how fast they're going in that Correct. case? Okay. Correct. Okay, all the same. So uh, find the uh, find the tension in the rope for each skier. Maybe draw a free body diagram first for the skier. There's the skier. What's touching the skier? The ground. Ground can push up on them with a normal force. And then with friction or what they're calling a resistive force, right? Some kind of resistance to their forward motion. Uh, what else is touching the skier, the rope? And that's everything that's touching the skier. What can reach in from a distance? Gravity. The, their weight. Okay. Now, what's the tension in the rope for skier A? Would it be 750 newtons? 750, because if there is no acceleration, these two forces have to exactly cancel out to zero, right? So there's only one force backwards, so the 
the force forward has to be equal to that. And the same for all of them, right? It's going to equal the resistive force. Tension in the rope only depends on the resistive force, not the velocity. Correct. Because their velocity is not changing. So we know the forces exactly cancel out. That's the key to understanding inertia. That's why we, with, without the idea of inertia, nothing really happened in physics for 2,000 years. <laughs> uh, once this object is moving at a certain speed, it's going to continue moving at that speed forever until a force acts on it and changes it. So if an object's moving at, uh, what is one of these moving at? At four meters per second in this direction, um, the only force the rope has to apply is to cancel out anything pushing backwards on it. So as the skier tries to go this way at four meters per second, the water and the air push back on it with a force of 750 newtons. So if we can just cancel out that 750 newtons, the skier will keep going at that speed forever. Okay, let's make it more interesting. Put some acceleration in there. Uh, let's put some numbers in. Let uh, the mass of each uh, skier be 50 kilograms. They're little skiers. And uh, the acceleration is going to be 2 meters per second squared to the right. Find the tension in the rope for each skier. You need to know the net force. <clears throat> all the skiers have the same mass and they all have the same acceleration. So they're all going to end up having the same net force. So we just have to do this once. A hundred newtons The net force on every one of these skiers is a hundred newtons.
we know that the sum of all the forces has to equal MA. <clears throat> and we have two forces here, right? In, in this direction, we don't care about the other two. Uh, there's no acceleration in the other direction. Um, I'll just say here, I'll say my X direction. <clears throat> and if the right is my positive direction, then I've got tension in the positive direction and I've got resistive force in the negative direction. T minus resistive force equals MA. MA is 100. So the tension has to be 100 newtons larger than the resistive force. See that if let's look at our free body diagram. This one has to be bigger than this one, right? <laughs> because it's accelerating in that direction. Does that make sense? So think about the situation, what makes sense. The free body diagram really helps. You know, you don't always need it, but it helps you visualize what's going on. You have a force pulling to the right, you have a force pulling to the left and there's acceleration to the right. So the force pulling to the right has to win, right? Has to be bigger. Okay, so you could do all the other ones, right? You just add 100 to the uh, resistive force. And just, just for the heck of it, let's do this one. Acceleration two meters per second squared to the left. I'm guessing we assume right is the positive direction. They call whatever you want to be positive. It's up to you. <laughs> okay. Doesn't matter to me. We're all, we all should get the same answer. The skier is moving to the right, right? Correct? The velocities are given here. We'll just go with those velocities. Skier is moving to the right, but the acceleration for this problem now is to the left. What does that mean? Acceleration just becomes negative now. Yeah, what does it mean for the skier? What's happening to the skier? He's slowing down. Slowing down, that's right. Okay. So if the that skier is slowing down, if we're looking at this picture here, this free body diagram, if the skier is slowing down and there's acceleration to the left, then this force, right, the resistive force, the one to the left, has to end up being bigger than the force to the right. It has to win so that our acceleration points in that direction. Okay? Mm-hmm. So we say uh, sum of the forces equals MA. Pick a direction as positive. Most of you would probably like the right to be positive. This is a vector equation, right? But we're just looking at the X direction right now. So we have a tension in the positive direction. We have a resistive force in the negative direction. We have the mass and the acceleration. The mass is uh, 50 and the acceleration is negative two, right? Two in the negative direction. And so we have tension is RF <coughs> minus 100 now. Uh, excuse me? Yeah, go ahead. How we can know the direction of the RF? Uh, it's given. Doesn't it say that? <clears throat> oh. I guess uh, they, they're calling it a resistive force. So it's, it's resisting their motion forward. The, the skier is moving to the right and it is a resistive force. So it's slowing, it's like friction. 
I guess you have to just sort of understand that it's um, impeding them moving forward. Did I, did that help? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Okay, let's talk a little bit about friction. A little more deep. We've, we've sort of discussed this a couple of times, but that's okay. Well, uh, it's worth going over in a little more detail. I have, I have some object here, and I'm pulling on it with some uh, applied force. Um, if, if, if that applied force is zero, the box is just sitting there. I'm not pulling on the, on the box at all. What's the friction force? Zero. Zero. So I'm going to start out right here, right? Now I pull with the force of one Newton, but the box just sits there at rest. What's the friction force? Should it still be zero? If I pull with the force of one Newton this way and the box doesn't move, what something must be pulling back that way, right? With an equal force to cancel out my pulling force. You see that? If you draw a free body diagram, if this box is at rest, Then the static friction for stat with static friction, we know for sure because the box isn't moving. And if I pull with the force of one Newton in this direction, then something has to pull back with the force of one Newton in that direction where the box would be moving, right? So I'm, I'm here now, right? Then if I pull with the force of two Newtons and the box still does not move, what is the friction force? Friction force would be two Newtons. We good? And as we keep increasing our pulling force, it keeps increasing. Uh, where's my... There, <clears throat> keeps increasing until we get to some maximum value. And then we pull a little bit harder and what happens, the whole box slides, starts to move and slides to the right. And when that happens, we're in kinetic friction mode. And this graph does something like this. That's supposed to be a horizontal line. So in this region here, this is a static, right? The box is not moving with respect to the ground. And you can see the static friction force, we don't know what it is. It could be anything from zero to some maximum value. We don't know what it is. We have to look at other things. We would have to know what the applied force was. Once we knew the applied force, then we can figure out what the static friction force is, right? We could figure it out but there's not a formula for it because it could be anything in here, right? It's a, it's a changes. And then over here, this is our kinetic friction. It is uh, linear, yeah. Because it's, it has to be equal to the applied force, right?
and the kinetic is a fixed value. So let me just jot down. The, this would be our maximum, our maximum static friction, F sub S maximum. And this value here would be our uh, kinetic friction. And that is a fixed value. It doesn't matter if the box just starts to slide and is moving at one meter per second or whether it's moving at 100 meters per second static friction force is the same. That's it, the kinetic friction force is the same. The kinetic friction force does not change. Okay, and what are they? Let's uh, fill them in here. The kinetic friction F sub K uh, is equal to, what do you think it depends on? Normal force. Normal force. No, and static because friction. you know the answer already. What would you think it depended on if you didn't know the answer already? Static force uh, or static friction? Sorry. It would depend on what would the friction force depend on? It would depend on the surfaces, right? Some surfaces are slippery and some are are rough, right? It would depend on the surface, right? We good with that? So uh, that's mu, that's, we've got a coefficient here that depends on the surfaces. So sometimes we have a coefficient of friction that's very low uh, because we have something like Teflon that is very slippery. Sometimes we have a coefficient of friction that's much higher because it's, uh, it's a rougher surface. And then what else? It would depend on how those surfaces interact. I like the way that's put, yeah, how the surfaces interact. So think about this for a second, whereas I don't have a... Here, I have a box. Box, here. <clears throat> so I've got this box sitting on the ground here, and I want to push it. What this the interaction with the box and the ground probably depends on something right like this much of my box is touching the ground right that's a lot of surface area touching the ground what would happen if i take my box and i put just this small surface area touching the ground instead and i push on it what's going to happen to my friction force you would think that that would have some effect, right? By changing all this big contact area with the ground versus this small contact area with the ground would have a different, would have an effect. But what happens when I have this big contact area with the ground? Each, let's just divide it up into square centimeters, right? Each square centimeter here has this much weight from the box pushing down on it, right? A square centimeter times the height of the box pushing down on it. What happens when I put this small surface area in contact with the ground? Each square centimeter has this much stuff pushing down on it. You see that? So we made the, the interaction area smaller, but each each little section is being pushed harder into the ground. So what really matters is the interaction between the two surfaces. And what force is the interaction between those two surfaces? The normal force, the normal force. We good with that? So that's why it might be kind of counterintuitive. You might think there should be a surface area or something here, but it automatically, it's sort of automatically taken into account when we use normal force there. So does like things like WD-40 change the coefficient of uh, friction then? Is that how it works? 
Uh, lubricants would, yeah, I guess technically that would just change the coefficient. Yeah, some things are, are tricky. We'll get into, um, well, we're talking about surface area right now. Um, so oftentimes people will ask, well, if, if you're into auto racing, my son is, so I get sort of secondhand information from him. But uh, the surface area, they use big tires on race cars. Why do they use big tires if, if the friction doesn't depend on area? And there's two reasons. Reason number one is that even if friction does not depend on area, the larger the contact area, the less energy is being absorbed by each little square centimeter of tire that's in contact with the ground. So the tire won't heat up as much, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, energy uh, th that's going into, the, into that tire and, and when it grips the road and the tire heats up and it wears out because it heats up, it wears out and then they have to change their tires more frequently, right? And in a race, that's time, right? So that's one reason, but really, the main reason is that friction does depend on area for a race car tire because their race car tires are very different than the mechanism we're talking here. So for the purposes of this class, we are looking at rigid surfaces rubbing against each other, okay? Solid, rigid surfaces rubbing against each other. A race car tire actually is sticky. So not only is there this friction mechanism going on, but there's a chemical bond, really, a chemical uh, 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 interaction with the ground that is making it stick to the ground like a, like a post-it note, right? It sticks to something. <clears throat> That's not friction that holds the post-it note to the wall when you stick it to the wall, right? It's a, it's a chemical bond that holds it to the wall. So because the race car tires are sticky, they, they have a coefficient of friction that's very high. It's more than one. And in this class, we will not see a coefficient of friction more than one because of the mechanism. We're just talking about solid, rigid surfaces rubbing against each other. The coefficient of friction, mu here, mu sub k, always less than one. A race car tire, because it's sticky, has a coefficient of friction that's something like three, I think. It's very high. And so because of that, uh, because it has a different mechanism that it, it interacts with the ground, the area does matter and a larger contact area does actually give it more friction force. Um, uh, okay, so good question. Kinetic friction and FS maximum. Yeah, the maximum static friction force is more than the uh, kinetic friction force. I think that's always true. It might depend on the coefficients of friction, um, but I think that is always true. And like I said, for the purposes of this class, when, we're when you're talking about solid, rigid surfaces interacting with each other. That's another reason why we have anti-lock braking systems on our cars. So when the car is rolling, when the wheel is turning and rolling, you, are, you have no motion between the tire and the road, right? There's static, that's a static surface between the tire and the road. There's no slipping, sliding, skidding when the car, when the wheel is turning. When you hit the brakes and start to slow down and the wheel is turning, there is static friction between the tire and the road. I know it's a little weird to think about that, but there's static friction between the tire and the road, right? That the, the tire is not sliding across the road, it's turning, and so the surfaces are not rubbing with respect to each other. If you were to go into a skid, if you lock your brakes, your, your car's going and you hit the brakes too hard and lock them, the wheel stops. And so your car goes into a skid, and now you're in kinetic friction mode. So it's actually possible to stop your car in a shorter distance if you could keep the, the 
tires rotating and keep the friction force up close to its maximum static friction force level. And every time the tire starts to lock, a computer goes in there and, and releases the brake pads a little bit so the tire starts rotating again. Then it squeezes again and it's, it, it, it controls the brakes. It, it knows when the tire locks and it eases up on the brake and lets the tire rotate again. So it keeps you in static friction mode. And it's, it's possible you could stop your car slightly sooner because you might actually end up with a larger uh, friction force by keeping it in static than if you go into a skid and you're in kinetic friction. But the real reason we use anti-lock brakes is that if your wheel is turning, if you're in static friction mode, if your wheels are turning, you can still steer your car. <laughs> if your wheels lock up and you're in kinetic friction, you're skidding, it, you, you can turn that wheel any way you want. Your car is going to find, it's going to go where it wants to go. You have no control over your car. So that's the main reason. But uh, the uh, secondary reason is that you might actually be able to stop your car in a shorter distance. Okay, that's kinetic friction. Static friction. So we already talked about the fact that we can't find, we don't know what the static friction force is going to be right here or what it's going to be right here. But we do know what it's going to be at the maximum point. We have a formula for that. So the F sub S maximum is going to be equal to mu sub S. This is a different coefficient times the normal force. So normally in a problem, you'd be given both. It would say the, uh, the kinetic friction coefficient is 0.2 and the static friction coefficient is 0.4, some, you know, something like that. Those are typical numbers and then you could solve the problem. Another way of writing this, some people write it this way, uh, the friction force is always less than or equal to mu times the normal force. <clears throat> okay. All right, we have been doing free body diagrams now a little bit, We've kind of been sneaking them in and doing them for objects. Uh, here's one for an object sitting on a horizontal surface, and we've done some other ones. Here's one for an object on a horizontal surface. And uh, so let's, let's do one for an object on an inclined surface. So we've got a box at rest sitting there on an inclined surface. And we wanna draw the free body diagram. Okay, you got your free body diagrams. How about this? Did anybody draw this as their free body diagram?
Nobody drew this as a free body diagram. <clears throat> so the reason you didn't draw this, think about this for a second. Is this what's happening? Is this a correct diagram? No. What's not touching the box? Gravity, right? Gravity is pulling toward the center of the earth. We good with that? Got a force of gravity pulling down. What's touching it? The surface is touching it. What must the surface be doing if the box is not moving? It must be supplying a force that's equal and opposite to that one. It must be supplying a force that looks like this. But what are we training ourselves to do? We're training ourselves to break this force up into components, right? Into a normal component and a parallel to the surface component. We call the normal component the normal force. We call the parallel component friction because that's, we know that surfaces, we have a, uh, an idea in our mind, a model in our mind of how a surface would interact with something. And we know that it could sort of react and cause a normal force and it can react to motion and cause a friction force. So we break this interaction. But really, if you just think of it as the surface interacting with something, kind of like the box, remember, I know you tried to forget it, but remember the person pushing the box across the ceiling and their hand was really pushing like this, right? And that worksheet was trying to get you to think of the hand like a surface and break it up into two forces that were acting uh, two forces that were acting like that, right? A normal force from the hand and a static friction force from the hand. But if we added these two vectors together, what would we get? We'd get a normal force from the hand and we get a friction force from the hand and those two added together would equal that one, right? We okay with that? So let's draw it the way, the way we normally draw these. Normally we would draw it like this. We would say there's a normal force. So I'm gonna, just for the heck of it, I'm gonna kind of sketch in a, the incline. Is that close enough? I think it's, I made it a little steeper, but that's okay. So there's my surface. If that's my surface, then my normal is gonna look kind of like that, right? <clears throat> And gravity is here. And I have a friction force that is acting in this direction. Static friction. And if I add my normal force and static friction, what do I get? If I add those two, I get that, and I could call that F surface, right? The surface is interacting with my object through a normal force and a friction force. And that interaction has to exactly cancel the force of gravity. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of that for now because we usually do it this way. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so I'm good with this. Now, what's our next step? Our next step is if we were working a problem, if we we're trying to figure out, I don't know, what the friction force is or something like that, what the coefficient of friction is, something. If we were working a problem, the next thing we would, do, we would wanna do is do some vector addition, right? And that means that we need to break these up into some components. Typically, what we would do is use the direction of the acceleration as one of our directions. This box is just sitting there at rest. But what would it do if, we, uh, if it wasn't at rest? It would probably be sliding down or up the incline, right? It would probably be moving along the incline. So let's pick the incline as one of our directions. 
we can pick this as our positive x direction. And if that's our x direction, then we would pick perpendicular to that as our y direction. So we have our x and y direction. We can pick any coordinate system we want, right? So we'll align it with the inclined plane. <clears throat> now we want to get these vectors, we want to break them up into components such that they are uh, in our new coordinate system. So the normal force, it's already in our coordinate system, right? It points in the y direction. The friction force is already in our coordinate system. It points in our x direction. We have to split up the force of gravity into an x and y component. Um, I actually don't like to use x and y. I like to use parallel and perpendicular, but uh, I think I'm stuck for, for this example. Okay, so we want to use components. And there's our, our object. There's our incline plane. I'm just going to kind of sketch it in. It helps me visualize our normal force, our friction force. <clears throat> and so I'm going to sort of just, there's, I made it a little bit too long. There, there is uh, F sub G, right? But we want to break that up into a normal, I'll use uh, green, I guess a normal component, that's gonna be what I'm calling the Y direction, right? And we have to figure out what that is, but I'm just gonna tell you right now and then we'll come back and show you later. And an X component, So if we add up those two vectors, we get this third vector. We really, you shouldn't have all three of them in the same free body diagram. That's why I tried to, let me get rid of this one. <clears throat> you shouldn't have all three in the same diagram. <clears throat> because you don't have three, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't have three forces of gravity acting on this. You either have the one that points towards the center of the earth or you have the two components, one or the other. All right, so let's see if I got these directions right. Let's go back and look at our picture here. If this is theta over here, this is the angle that the incline makes with the horizontal. <clears throat> the force of gravity points straight down towards the center of the earth, right? That's uh, F sub G. <clears throat> And I'm breaking that up into two vectors. I'm saying I can really write that as this vector, F, G, Y, plus this vector, F, G, F, X. <clears throat> right, this is a 90 degree, this is a right triangle here. <clears throat> And FGY is going to equal FG times the cosine of this angle up here. You see that? Because this is a right triangle. Where's my green highlighter? This is a right triangle right here, you see? That's a right triangle. We good with that? <clears throat> That's a right triangle. So uh, the, the side I'm interested in, the Y component, is equal to the hypotenuse, which is the force of gravity, times the cosine of this angle right here. I just sort of put the black line there, right there out, this angle right here. So I just have to figure out what that angle is. So now let me go back. Now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna look at this triangle. I'm gonna look at this triangle. Okay. If I look at this, this shaded triangle, I have theta in this corner. I have 90 degrees over here. So this up here, I'm gonna draw it in red. This up here is 90 minus theta. 
And we know that this whole thing, this is 90 degrees, this whole thing is 90, right? So the angle I'm interested in has to be theta. So this is cosine theta. <clears throat> and the blue one down here is going to be the hypotenuse times the sine of theta. So the key is that this angle right here is theta. What you want to do is convince yourself that that's true. So, you know, later on today, draw this out real carefully, make sure you understand that that angle is the same as the angle with the horizontal, the, 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 it's the same as this one down here, okay? All right, um, let's take a 10 minute break. And we'll uh, come back to Newton's laws. Okay, <clears throat> we're back. We're talking about friction, and that is our application of the day. So lots of uh, uh, interesting things with friction. Um, and, you know, we've talked about is sometimes you want to minimize friction. People have talked about lubricants that we use to sort of minimizing friction. Sometimes you want to maximize friction, right? If you're running and you want to be able to speed up and slow down and make turns, right? You want to be able to maximize the friction. So running shoes have those soles uh, that are real grippy tires. You want to maximize the friction between the tire and the road, uh, have that uh, material that has, can grip really well. Um, racing tires have coefficients greater than three, right? The objects that we're going to be dealing with are between, uh, between zero and one. Sometimes you want to minimize friction. So we use uh, lubricants, right? Like in the engines of our cars and, uh, and other places. And one of the modern lubricants that you're starting to hear about now, maybe you've heard about them in chemistry class, are these things called buckyballs. 60 carbon atoms arranged in the shape of a soccer ball, and they act like uh, microscopic ball bearings. Um, and I just wanted to give you a, a little example in sports, right? You get this a lot. There's a picture of my son playing roller hockey. Roller <coughs> or inline hockey, right? You're playing on roller blades. You've got, uh, got those wheels in line and those wheels are really high tech. I know because they're really expensive. So if the wheel, if the rubber in those wheels is soft, You'd think, wow, that's good, right? It makes them grip really well and you could turn hard and you get lots of friction. But think about this, if it's really soft, they, they get kind of mushy and it's hard to go fast. It's like running through sand, right? <laughs> when, if you try to run through sand, well, you do a lot of work and you don't go very fast. And so if you use really soft wheels, yeah, you get lots of grip, but they're kind of mushy and, and you can't skate very fast. So you want them to be pretty hard, but you also want them to have some softness to them so you can grip and get turned. What they do is they make the center core really stiff. And then they put a thin layer of soft rubber around the outside of them. And so they're pretty high tech, uh, but they're pretty expensive. They're like 12 or 14 bucks a, a wheel. And you know, there's eight, <laughs> eight to four wheels on each skate costs you a hundred bucks every time uh, every time your kid needs new skates uh, need needs new wheels and my kids burn through wheels pretty quickly okay so um so a lot of examples of friction right in our everyday lives here uh, let's take a look at a problem now let's start putting this together and make make a real problem um let's have our uh Right, let's just, uh, should we finish? Uh, let's finish our box sitting on the incline thing. So 
if this was a real problem, let's just make it into a real problem here and uh, solve for something, uh, figure out what the friction force is or something like that. Um, so we've got a box sitting there at rest and uh, we wanna know, um, you know what the, uh, what the coefficient of friction is or what the friction force is or something like that. So we've, we've broken up our, our forces into components that are either parallel to our incline or perpendicular to our incline. And then we'll say the sum of the forces has to equal ma. And this is a vector equation. And we will break this up into our components, into our coordinate system. We can pick any coordinate system, but the one that kind of makes the most sense for, for typically for these problems, not always, but typically for these problems with an incline is to choose the incline as one of our directions. So, uh, so that's what we did earlier. So that means we're going to call one of these, uh, and I, like I said, I'm using X and Y, but um, usually I, I prefer parallel and perpendicular, but I, I started with X and Y, so I'll just finish this problem that way. So that means in the X direction, the sum of the forces in our X direction has to equal the mass times the acceleration in that direction. And we'll pick up direction as positive. I'll pick uh, up the incline as my positive direction. And then in the y direction, I say the sum of the forces in the y direction has to be m a sub y. And uh, uh, we're picking uh, up as our positive direction, sort of. I, I know we're on an incline here, right? This is our incline. This is our incline. So uh, up the incline is our positive x. Up and perpendicular to the incline is our positive y. So in our x direction, let me pick a color here. How about blue? In my x direction, <clears throat> I have two forces, friction and uh, the weight that's along the incline there, what I'm calling Fg sub x. The, uh, the weight is down in the negative direction and uh, friction is up in the positive direction. So I've got a positive static friction force and a negative um, Fg sub x. And that has to be m times the acceleration in that direction. And what is the acceleration in that direction? Zero. Zero, it's at rest, it's just sitting there, right? That tells me that my friction force is equal to the force of gravity in the x direction. And we know that this is just going to be the force of gravity times sine theta. And we know the force of gravity is mg. OK, so there's my static friction force. And what is static friction force? It's mu static times the normal force. No, no, it's not. It's the maximum it can be. I'm just going to leave this as F sub S. <clears throat> Let's just leave it as F sub S. Maybe there, the question is, what's the maximum angle we could have before this thing starts to slide or something like that? Then we could solve, we could plug in the maximum static friction force, but let's just leave it there. <clears throat> okay, and then in the y direction, why do I do the perpendicular direction? Why do I do the y direction? To find the normal force. That's always why we do this. This is... to find the normal force. <clears throat> Why do I need the normal force? Because there's friction in my system and I need to figure out what the friction is, right? Typically that's the thought process. So in my Y direction, I'll use a green for that. In my Y direction, that's this, oops, it's this direction. I've got two forces. I've got a normal force in the positive direction and FGY in the negative direction.
and that has to equal m times the acceleration in the y direction, which is almost always zero, right? Our box typically does not jump up off the incline or fall down through the incline, right? It typically slides along the incline, right? So our a sub y almost always zero. That means our normal force is equal to fg in the y direction, which is mg cos theta. So that gives us our normal force. <clears throat> and then typically we plug that into our other equation to solve for something else. Okay. <clears throat> All right, should we use, do a pulley problem now? All right, so we've got uh, M1, M2, we've got a pulley here. <clears throat> and this whole thing is moving to the right. Uh, And that means this guy must be moving down. You have to know what direction they're moving. That has to be given. <clears throat> and uh, right now, we've already discussed this, but I'll say it again. We don't know how to deal with objects with dimension, right, where that can rotate. We will in a few weeks. But right now, we can't deal with a pulley that's rotating. So we're going to say that this pulley is massless, which is happening. There we go. And this rope, let's, let's call that tension one. And let's call that tension two. If the pulley is massless, then the tension one has to equal tension two. The tension is the same. And if, since they're equal, I'm just gonna call it T. No reason to give the different subscripts if we know it's the exact same value, right? But if, we, if it could be different, then you need different subscripts. Question? And uh, yeah, I thought that tension was a uh, vector. So how could these be the same? Uh, so the magnitudes would be the same. The okay. tension, usually when we talk about tension in a rope, it's, um, we've, we're talking about the magnitude. Okay. But uh, when we apply it to a box or something, then it becomes a vector, right? So if I have a box uh, being pulled by a rope like this, then I, I need my free body diagram, right, would look like that. And if I have a box uh, being pulled by a rope like this, right, my free body diagram would look like that. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and so we'll have, uh, we'll have some friction here, might as well make it interesting. And so we'd have to be given some information. So if we were given um, the masses, M1 and M2, uh, coefficients of friction, <clears throat> in this case it's moving, so all we need is the kinetic coefficient of friction, and the fact that the pulley is massless, Uh, we can find the um, acceleration 
and the uh, tension in the rope. <clears throat> so what you want to think about with these problems is you know, what kinds of things are you being asked for? In this problem, we're being asked for acceleration and tension. So an acceleration and a force. So you kind of, in your mind, you're already thinking F equals MA, right? That's an equation that has forces and accelerations in it, F equals MA. If I was asking you for a final velocity or for a distance traveled or a time it takes to move a certain distance, then you're thinking, well, I know I can do that with kinematics equations, um, you know, but maybe I'm missing something. Oh, wait a minute, I could use F equals MA to find the acceleration and then use maybe my kinematics equation to find the final speed or you know, the time it takes, something like that. Um, so those, those work. you got to kind of think through it, though. Sometimes in these problems, the acceleration is not constant. So you could use F equals MA to solve for the acceleration at this split second, but a, a little bit later or a little bit earlier, the acceleration was different. Like, for example, if I put a spring in here, if I put a spring here, attach it, as that spring gets stretched, the force from the spring changes because when you pull on a spring at first, it's really easy to pull and then it gets harder and harder and harder. The force from the spring changes, which means the acceleration changes. So even if you found the acceleration at some instant using F equals MA, you could not use a kinematics equation. Those only work for constant acceleration. So you'd need some other technique maybe something that we're going to learn next week or with the week after energy, right? We could maybe use energy then. So you want to start thinking about what, you know, what type of problem is this and what, what can I use to solve for what I'm uh, looking for? <clears throat> All right. And when you do these Newton's law problems, F equals MA problems, our, our plan here is to use F equals MA for every mass in our system. So box one, we're gonna say F equals MA for box one. Box two, F equals MA. So we have two equations, which means we can solve for two unknowns. If the pulley also had mass, we would have three equations, one for M1, one for M2, one for the pulley, we'd have three equations and we could solve for three unknowns. We could solve for the acceleration and we could solve for T1 and we could solve for T2. Okay, so the, for each mass in your system, you're gonna have an equation. So let's draw free body diagrams for each mass in our system. In our case, we only have two. <clears throat> so go ahead and draw those. Let's start with the easy one. Let's start with two. Let's draw two first. Are you done? What's touching M2? The rope. So here's M2. That's the only thing that's touching it. What can reach in from a distance <clears throat> and exert a force on something? There's only one thing this quarter that can do that, gravity. Okay, so tension, <clears throat> I'm going to have more than one tension. I'm also going to have a tension, well, let's just, uh, let's just keep going and then we'll I'll fix the subscripts later. Let's do M1. M1 is here. What's touching M1? The surface.
surface can interact two ways, right? Through a normal force and through a friction force. And if the box is sliding to the right, our kinetic friction is going to be to the left. And we have a, a rope touching, touching the box. So we've got a tension force pulling it to the right. That's everything that's touching the box, I believe. What can reach in from a distance? Gravity. All right, so now I look at this and I say, wait a minute, I've got two tensions. I've got one for M1, one for M2. Are they the same? Yes, they are. So I can just call them both the same thing, T. And I've got two weights, FG and FG. Are they the same? No. So I cannot call them the same thing. I have to use something different. So I will call this FG1 and this FG2. Now I'm good, right? I've only got one normal force in my system, so I know that's just, I just have to call it N. I don't need a subscript. There's only one of them, okay? And this is just equal to M1G, and this is equal to M2G. That's okay. Now, for each of these masses, we are going to say, some of the forces is MA. <clears throat> M2. M2 is not touching anything, right? It's not touching any surface. The normal force is an interaction with a surface. So just think about what's touching it. As you go around this box, what's touching it? And the only thing that's touching it is the rope. And then, so we've got that. And then the only thing that can reach in from a distance is gravity. But right? it's not in contact with anything. That's why I'm, you're gonna get tired of me walking through these <laughs> free body diagrams. What's touching it? This is touching it, that's touching. What can reach in from a distance? But if that's the thought process you go through, it should help you get your free body diagrams right. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, some of the forces equals MA. Uh, M1, M2. Some of the forces uh, on, uh, on one, M1A. Some of the forces on two, M2 times its acceleration. <clears throat> so the question is, how do their accelerations compare? acceleration of one versus the acceleration of two. Do we know anything about that relationship? <clears throat> they are the same, yeah. And with pulleys, this can be very tricky because we can set up pulleys such that we get different accelerations. The way to tell is if you move M1 if you move M1 by one meter, how much does M2 move by? If you move M1 one meter, M2 is gonna go down one meter, right? They are a one-to-one -one relationship. That means that if M1 is moving one meter per second, M2 is also moving one meter per second, right? They're connected. And if M1 is accelerating at 10 meters per second, M2 is accelerating at 10 meters. They're connected that way, right? <clears throat> so, um, so that's an easy way to tell. If you move M1 by one meter and M2 only goes down half a meter, then everything is gonna be half. If M1 goes two meters per second, M2 is gonna be dropping at one meter per second, half as much, right? And if this is accelerating at four, this is gonna be accelerating at two. Everything will be half. You can look at the distance 
and do that because we often use pulleys to try to get some kind of mechanical advantage. We use pulleys to lift up a heavy box by putting in a small force. You, you could pull with a small force and lift something very heavy, but you would have to pull 10 meters of rope to get the box to go up one meter if you wanted a, a big advantage, right? And so uh, it, uh, we use pulleys to gain that mechanical advantage, but you can kind of figure it out by looking at the situation, how much something moves. So in this case, it's pretty straightforward, right? They're, it's a one-to-one. -one. All right, so they're the same. These accelerations are the same, right? The acceleration one, the magnitudes are all the same. So I'm just gonna call it A. Don't need subscripts if they're the same, right? So on this side, I've got some of the forces is M1A. And on this side, this is a vector equation. Some of the forces on two, M2A. The magnitudes of those accelerations are the same. Now I break these up into, into components. So this is where I'm gonna not use X and Y. I'm gonna use parallel and perpendicular. And the reason is <clears throat> that when block one moves, when block one moves in this direction, block two goes down. So my, the pulley, what the pulley is doing is it's bending my one dimensional motion 90 degrees. But really, this is, this is really a one dimensional motion problem. When block one moves to the right, block two goes down. So this, this green line I just drew, that's my direction of motion. Does that sort of make sense? And if the thing I, I the reason I don't want to use X's and Y's is if you use X and Y, you're going to use horizontal for X probably and Y for vertical. And so your M1, the direction that M1 is moving, you're gonna call that your X direction, aren't you? And then you get over here, and what are you gonna call the direction M2 moves? You're probably gonna call that your Y direction, right? If you're using horizontal and vertical. But now you're thinking one is moving in the X direction, the other one's moving in the Y direction. No, they're linked, they're, it's, it's the same, they're linked together. So I'm calling them, I call that my parallel to the direction of motion. You can call it whatever you want. <laughs> I call it parallel, and this will be the perpendicular to the direction of motion. And so that's for block one. But what happens, I'm just gonna follow that rope, and what happens when I get to block two? When I get to block two, this is my parallel direction. And this is my perpendicular direction. So I, might, I just let my thumb be the parallel directions following block two, and it goes down the rope. And so uh, that's what I would use as my coordinate system. So parallel to the direction of motion or perpendicular to the direction of motion. So each object has a different reference then? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so I've got, I break this up. Some of the forces parallel to the direction of motion is M1 times its acceleration. And I have to pick a positive direction. Should we just make the right our positive direction? I usually draw it right there, right is positive. And I also am gonna have some of the forces perpendicular is going to be, what's it going to be? It's gonna be zero because this box is not jumping up off the incline or falling through. It's always at the same Y value, whatever Y, I just use Y. It's always at the same perpendicular value, right? We'll call that uh, a zero. 
Uh, it's always on the surface of the incline. It doesn't jump up off, it doesn't fall down through. There's no acceleration, there's no movement at all in that direction. So the acceleration there is zero. You okay with that? And then what I can do is uh, look at my other blah. I'm just gonna kind of go through one step at a time for both blocks. In the other block, I'm gonna get um, some of the forces parallel to the direction of motion is m2, its mass, times its acceleration. And I don't have a perpendicular, there's nothing, nothing happens perpendicular, right? There are no forces, there's no acceleration, zero equals zero. We good with that? So I only have a parallel. Uh, yes, you could actually. Um, if you treated, so the question is, can you just straighten the rope out and kind of visualize this all moving in one direction? The answer is yes, if you add a force at the end equal to the force of gravity. Right, so if you have this situation, one, two, FG2 here, then that's the, that's the same thing. Did I answer your question? <clears throat> um, professor? Yeah. Uh, when we're thinking in terms of like parallel and perpendicular and uh, like, I guess in regards to like the, will, will be uh, in the second, the second mass or second block. It'd be like, it'd be, when we think of parallel, it's like parallel to the, like to what exactly? To the direction of motion. So, Block two is moving straight down. So I'm calling that my direction. Of, so it's really the direction of motion. At direction of motion and perpendicular to direction of motion. I see, okay. You could call it X and Y here, but then you should call this one X and this one Y, right? As long as you kind of stay with the direction that something's moving as a constant, uh, vary, as a constant um, uh, symbol, whatever you're using, that's okay. So then what would something like perpendicular in the, in the second block, like what would it look like if it was like a perpendicular, it was perpendicular? It'd be anything Well, like you'd need something, let's, uh, so like, let's say we had this situation. Okay, if we had this situation, Block one, you want to draw a free body diagram real, real quick for. For block one. And a free body diagram for block two. <clears throat> so block one would have something normal force, maybe a uh, kinetic friction, tension, and uh, M1G, something like that. We good with that? Yeah. And block two, if this was our incline, then it would have, what would it have? It would have a normal force. If it's, well, let's assume it's moving this way. If it's moving that way, then it has a friction force in this direction, F kinetic on block two, right? Uh, it's got a tension and a string pulling up this way, right? That's everything that's touching it. And then it's got force of gravity, which points towards the center of the earth, but I'm gonna break it up into a FG um, sine theta and an FG cosine theta, where this angle here is theta. Right. Okay, so my direction of motion, let me get out my highlighter. My direction of motion is, is this way, right? So for block one, 
I have a parallel that's moving in the in this horizontal direction. So I'm going to make horizontal one of my one of my directions and perpendicular to that to the other one. But then over here for block two, I'm going to make down the incline the direction it's moving and perpendicular to that is this other direction, right? That's supposed to be a perpendicular. So this, now you can see this guy too, it has forces in the parallel direction, just like this one did up here, right? It had forces in the parallel direction, but it also has forces in the perpendicular direction, right? The normal force, it's interacting with something that's causing forces, but it's not moving at all in that direction. But that's perpendicular to, it, how, it, to how it's moving. You see that? Yeah, I see now. And then this one up here, there's nothing, there's nothing pushing horizontal on it, so we can just ignore that. Did that I help? See. Yeah, that, that, that helped illustrate it. So let me do this, let me... Um, Let me just move it down. <laughs> I'll leave it there, but I'll. Ah. Okay. Side note. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's go back up to this guy. Uh, okay, so we are uh, we are just writing out our basic equations. F equals m a for object one. We've split that into two um, two directions, right? In the direction of motion and perpendicular to the direction of motion. And always, if we're picking perpendicular to the direction of motion, it's always going to have a zero acceleration because it's not moving in that direction. This is the perpendicular direction to how it's moving. So those, those two should always be linked, right? Anytime you have an F perpendicular, you should have a zero acceleration. <clears throat> um, okay, next step. Let's fill in what we know here. So we're looking at the green, looking at our green arrow here, and this becomes we have a tension force in the positive direction. We have a friction force in the negative direction. And those are the only two forces we have in the direction of motion acting on block one. So that's our equation for block one. We know something about kinetic friction though. We know that it is equal to mu, some constant that depends on the surfaces, we'd be given that probably, times the normal force. So we need the normal force, right? We have too many unknowns here. We have a acceleration, we have a normal force, we have a tension. What just happened up here? F sub K. Sometimes it just decides to erase things. Okay, um, so we have three unknowns, right? That's not gonna help us. We need, to, we need to start plugging in some of these things, but we know how to get N. We use the perpendicular direction. Boy, it does not like this over here. Come on, stay there. <clears throat> All right, we use the perpendicular direction to get the normal force. So, and you know, this case, I mean, you can look at this and you know what the normal force is, right? It's the weight of the object, but they're gonna get trickier. Down here, can you look at that and know what the normal force is? Well, after you do a few problems, yeah, you can probably look at that and know what the normal force is, but they can get trickier. What if the rope 
wasn't parallel to the incline, if the rope was at an angle, that would really mess with the normal force. So it really pays to draw the free body diagram and look at that direction and use it to figure out the normal force. So I know this one's simple, but I'm just going through the steps you would use on a more complicated problem. So I'm looking at the perpendicular direction. That is, uh, that is this direction now, right? <clears throat> I've got two forces. I've got a normal force in my positive direction. I've got a force of gravity in my negative direction. Okay, so I know my normal force. I can plug it in over here. And that gives me this equation, T <clears throat> So these, these two uh, have combined into one equation. I told you earlier, for each mass in your system, you get one equation. So this is the one equation from mass one. Unfortunately, I have two unknowns. That means I need to go to mass two and get the second equation. So I look at mass two, I've got some of the forces equals MA. Uh, what direction should we pick as positive? I know what most of you would do. Now I'm gonna tell you why that would be wrong. <laughs> Not wrong, harder, it would be harder. Most of you would pick up as positive, right? But that would be, make this problem more difficult <clears throat> because the accelerations of my two blocks would not be the same anymore. So this is what I do, this is my rule of thumb for picking positive directions. The first block, pick any direction you want to be positive. Usually it doesn't matter. If I know the acceleration is in a certain direction, I pick that direction because that helps me later on. Uh, in this case, I knew that this block, if we let go of this thing, what is block one going to do? It's going to accelerate to the right, and block two is going to accelerate down. So I chose the right as my acceleration for block one, but really, it doesn't really matter, but I try to pick the acceleration. But the important part here, once you pick the positive direction for the first mass in your system, that fixes the positive direction for everything else, if you want to have the same acceleration for everything. And you do, because it makes it simpler. So when M1, I picked M1 going to the right as the positive direction. So that now has to fix the positive direction for everything else. When M1 goes to the right, the pulley turns clockwise. So if I had a, a pulley with mass, I would choose the clockwise direction as the positive direction. And when M1 goes to the right, M2 goes down. So I'm going to choose down as my positive direction for M2 so that they have the same acceleration. Otherwise, one of them would be positive and one of them would be negative. And I'd have to remember that, put a negative number in, and I probably wouldn't do that. And so this is just an easy way of getting my signs right. Let me put a red box around that. All right, so over here, over here, we said the magnitudes of the acceleration were all the same. And now we're saying that the directions are also the same because of the 
kind of crazy way we've we've defined our coordinate system it gets it keeps the sign the same okay all right um so what do i have i have m g in the positive direction this one is positive tension is negative and i add them up and i have to get m2 times the acceleration so i'm that's it i'm done with that i only have two unknowns tension and acceleration everything else is given and now i can solve i've got two equations and two unknowns i can do some algebra solve for acceleration and tension Okay, we good with that? We have time to talk about this one? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Got a box, a heavy box, sitting at rest on an incline. There's friction between the box and the incline, and a rope pulling uh, on the box in the direction shown parallel to the incline. A physics student draws the free body diagram you see. What if anything is wrong with that free body diagram? Can you see what it says there? It's not a very good picture, is it? This one says, on the box by the rope. So this is, uh, this is T rope on box. This one says on the surface by the box. So this is F box on surface. This one is the weight on the box by the earth. And this one says, what does that one say? On box by surface. Does that help a little bit? <clears throat> What's the first problem? Correct. They've labeled this incorrectly, right? They have the friction from the box on the surface here. If this is a free body diagram for the box, every one of these forces needs to be on the box. So that's the first problem. Let's uh, fix that. Surface on box. Okay, so now let's uh, think about that. What do you think about the direction of that force? Everything else we're okay with, right? Normal force, tension, Weight, those all look good. What about that friction force? I'll tell you what, let's do this. Uh, I'll give you a chance to think about it and we'll start next class with that. How does that sound? <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to uh, pause the recording, stop the recording.
And if you want to stick around, uh, I know some of you have lab now, but if you want to stick around, I will answer 